Amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name with your copy of God's word in hand. I invite you to turn in there with me to the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, to Luke chapter 10. I need another minute. Luke chapter 10, and, and for the purpose of our discussion this morning, we will be reading and reviewing together the first 12 verses. When you've arrived at that section of your, in your Bible, announce your arrival by saying amen. 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 You please stand with me in the honor of reading of God's word. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. Allow me to put a tag on this text Help wanted. Help wanted. My Bible reads this way. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them, to, sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you, heal the sick who are there, and tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this. The kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day for Sodom than for that town. Let me read again verse 2, which we will be spending a lot of time in this morning. He told them, the, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Will you pray with me? Father God, help us by your spirit to see the great truths contained in your word, that our lives would be changed as a result. And as always, our prayer is this, Father God, as your word is explained, as we draw near to you, you would be exalted. And we pray this in Jesus' name and all who are God's people said. The first Friday of every month, the Bureau of Labor Statistics releases its monthly jobs report. The job report is an estimation of the number of people who were employed and unemployed during the previous month. It estimates the number of hours worked and how much people earned. And in the November jobs report that looks back to the employment statistics of October, there is good news. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, over 270,000 new jobs were created in the month of October. And there's more good news after that. Not only were there more jobs created, 100,000 more than previously forecast, but people are also earning more, about 0.4% more than they ever had. The strong jobs report for the month of October continues in what has been a string of strong job reports. The Bureau of Labor Statistics say that Jobs have been created 
more jobs have been created in 61 consecutive months than any other period in the history of the United States. During this 61 consecutive month period, over 12 million new jobs have been created and people are earning about 7% more than they ever had during this 61 month period. But for all the strong jobs report that you've heard, there still is a problem in the employment market. For all these jobs, these 12 million jobs that have been created, there are still millions and millions of Americans who are still looking for work. Despite the fact that there have been all these new jobs created, the unemployment rate, though historically low at 5%, still means that there are 8 million Americans who are looking for work but can't find work. And the statistics may be even worse when you consider the Americans who are underemployed and the Americans who have simply out of sheer frustration left the job market and are no longer looking for employment. Despite the strong economy in the last few months, despite the fact that jobs have created, have been created when it comes to the employment labor system in America, the opportunities are few, but the laborers are many. In the job reports that Jesus has for us in Luke chapter 10, we find that heaven has the opposite story. Luke chapter 10 is the jobs report according to Jesus. It is a, an assessment of the labor market when it comes to the business and the economy of heaven. It comes at the beginning of a section of the book of Luke known as the travel narrative. The travel narratives chronicle the events in the ministry of Jesus as Jesus travels from Galilee all the way to Jerusalem. During this period, Jesus would heal the sick, he would teach lessons, and he would encounter a number of people on his way to Jerusalem. And it was the habit of Jesus as he was traveling from village to village, from town to town, from region to region, to send out emissaries before him. Already in, in Luke chapter 9, we find Jesus sending out a group of 12 apostles to visit regions that he intended to make an appearance in. And at the beginning of the travel narratives in Luke chapter 9, we find Jesus commissioning the 12 and endowing that group with power and authority to subdue demons, to heal sickness and disease, and, and most importantly, to proclaim the message of the kingdom of God. That group was to serve as Jesus' representatives in villages that Jesus was prepared to visit. That group was given the assignment of preparing the hearts of the people so that they may, see, may receive Jesus when Jesus came. Now, if their mission sounds familiar, that's because it should. The, the mission of the 12 is the mission of the church. We, we have been commissioned by Jesus to represent Jesus doing everything that Jesus did in order to prepare a world for Jesus' coming. In Luke chapter 10, we encounter another commissioning story. This is not a commissioning story of 12 individuals, but rather a group of 72 people. Jesus basically gives them the same assignment that he had previously given to the 12. They are to visit the regions that Jesus will pre is preparing to make an appearance in to prepare that region to receive Jesus. Jesus gives them authority to perform certain tasks that only he could perform. But before the 72 travel out, Jesus gives them instructions to prepare them for their journey. He sends them out in groups of two, a total of 36 in, in the ancient world. In order for a testimony to be believed, it had to be corroborated by another witness. 
by sending them out in groups of two. Jesus was giving them the necessary witness to corroborate their story. He then gives them an assessment of the job market. This is Jesus' job report according to the business of heaven. He, he looks at the 72 and proclaims that when it comes to kingdom opportunities, there are opportunities available. He says that the harvest is plenty. Jesus would often use agricultural observations to make a, a kingdom point. In agriculture, when a harvest is ready to be reaped, they would call in workers to do the assignment of reaping that harvest. Jesus makes this observation that the harvest is plentiful, meaning that there is an abundance of crop to be reaped. But Jesus is not talking about literal crop. He's talking about people. The Old Testament frequently describes people as being God's harvest. But in making the observation that the harvest is plentiful, Jesus is saying more than this, there are many people in the world. Jesus is saying that by the harvest of people being plentiful, that God has worked in the lives of people so that they are now ripe to receive the message of the kingdom. But, but what conditions in their lives make them ripe to receive the message of the kingdom. Matthew 9 sets the narrower context from which Jesus makes this statement. In Matthew 9, we have the same commissioning story, but Matthew provides us a, a little bit more information that helps us assess the, the context of this statement. And in Matthew 9, Jesus makes this statement. Only after traveling from region to region in Galilee, only after observing and encountering the, the helpless and the hopeless, the sick and the lame, the disenfranchised and the marginalized. He, he, he makes this statement only after observing the hurts and the pains of other people. And having observed the hurts and the pains of the people, he has compassion for them. And that's when he makes the statement the harvest is plentiful. Jesus means by that, that the hurts and the pains of other people make them ripe to receive the message of the gospel. Jesus says that God speaks to people through our hearts and it's by our hearts that we receive Jesus and the gospel because the gospel is the answer to our hearts. Jesus has said about his, his ministry and his message already in Luke 4, 18, he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of our Lord, of the Lord's favor. The gospel, according to Jesus, is good news to people who are hurting. The, the gospel is good news to the helpless and the hopeless. It's the message that, that God cares about what we go through. It's, it's the message that, that God sees our tears, that, that God knows about our pain. And, and God is not just some detached observer watching us struggle, but God has answered our most urgent need by sending his son Jesus to die on a cross on our behalf so that we can have hope. So for Jesus, wherever there was hurt, wherever there was pain, there was also an opportunity for God to speak the gospel into the lives of people and for them to receive the good news of what God is doing. Renowned preacher Joseph Barker put it like this, the gospel speaks to the hurt of people, therefore it will never lack an audience. Jesus says that the gospel is plentiful, 
only after observing the tragic condition of people. And the tragic condition of people was for Jesus an opportunity for them to hear the gospel because the gospel is good news to those who are hurting. Our world, less than 48 hours ago, was rocked by the news of the events in Paris. ISIS conducted six separate simultaneous and coordinated terrorist attacks on soft targets throughout Paris, leaving 130 people dead, according to some statistics, and over 350 people injured. Eight assailants attacked cafe goers, concert goers, and, and soccer fans that were just out hoping to enjoy a, a peaceful evening in one of the most iconic cities in the world. It's, it's the worst act of violence in Paris since World War II. I, I, I heard about the news just prior to the celebration of our couple's ministry. And, and, and one member of our couple's ministry shared this story, a conversation that she had with a nine-year-old girl. She was trying to explain to the nine-year-old girl the events that just happened. And, and as expected, the nine-year-old girl had a slew of questions. But, but at the end of their talk, the nine-year-old girl had one, this one heartbreaking question. After learning about the number of people who had died, after learning about the number of people who were injured, the nine-year-old girl asked, where is God in all this? And that's the question that the world will have making the events in, in Paris not only a horrible tragedy, but also an opportunity for us to come in and answer that question. The answer to that question, where is God, is that God is in the midst of our hurts. God is in the midst of our pains. That we serve a God who, though he sits on high, he looks down low. And he's not detached from our pain. He's not detached from our suffering. Rather, he has answered our most urgent need in the gospel. Because the gospel is the answer to our hope, to our pain and our hurts. The answer gives us, the gospel gives us hope in a helpless and hurting world. So whenever there are hurting people, whether they are in your bedroom, in your backyard, in your church, or in your community. There is an opportunity for the gospel message to be received. Jesus says that the harvest is plentiful only because that there are so many hurting people in the world. And, and the first part of Jesus is job assessment. He says there is a surplus of opportunities. But in the second part of Jesus' market assessment, he gives us some sobering and discouraging news. The fight, despite the surplus of job opportunities, there is a shortage of laborers. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. This would be unheard of if this was a literal harvest during literal harvest season. And in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus tells the story of a landowner who was looking for people to work in his vineyard. And Jesus says that the landowner woke up at 6 o'clock in the morning, went to the market, and found laborers willing to work. He, he then went out again at 9 o'clock in the morning, and found laborers willing to work. He, he repeated this pattern three more times, going out again at 12, at 3 o'clock, and at 5 o'clock. And on every occasion that the landowner went out, he found laborers willing to work in the heat hot of the Palestinian summer, willing to gather crops. This, this story that Jesus tells is believable, because it is unheard of in the ancient world for laborers not to be willing to work. If this was a literal harvest, <laughs> during literal harvest season, this wouldn't be the case. There would be more than enough workers 
to suit the need, but because this is a spiritual harvest, for looking for people to work in a spiritual field, Jesus says that there are not enough laborers to meet the need. For whatever reason, those who have benefited from hearing the gospel, those who have received the message of Jesus, those whose lives have been made better and transformed by the work of other people aren't willing to work themselves to make the lives of other people better. The laborers are few because you and I, who have been transformed by the message of the gospel, are reluctant to go back into the field and work. It's sobering and discouraging and disappointing all at the same time. In his book, The Other 80%, Warren Bird tells us, explains to us why the laborers are, are few. He gives us three reasons why Christians are so reluctant to go back into the labor field and do the work of Christ. He, he first of all says that the laborers are few because more so than any other group, Christians are apathetic. We don't care that it's possible for, for you to see people who are hurting, people who are in pain, people who are in the same condition that you used to be and walk by and not care. We are apathetic. We don't, we don't care what is going on in the rest of the world. We're, we simply want to rejoice and celebrate the fact that we're not like them anymore. He goes on to say that another reason why the laborers are few, not only are Christians apathetic, uh, but that Christians are easily distracted. We are consumed by what is going on in our own lives. We are consumed by our own careers. We are consumed by our own family. We are consumed by our own finances that we do, are not willing to take a look up and see the hurts and the pains of other people. And finally, Warren Bird writes that, Another reason why the laborers are few is because not only are we apathetic, not only are we distracted, but we are also easily discouraged. We will volunteer, we will commit to the work of Christ, but, but the minute that instead of 500 people showing up, only two people show up, we say that the work of the Lord is not worth it, I'm through with this, I'm not doing this, anymore, that we become easily discouraged by what God is not doing in our lives, that we are not encouraged by the work that God is doing through us on behalf of other people. And, and brothers and sisters, Central, this should not be the case. Those whose lives have been transformed by the message of the gospel should be more than anyone else willing to go out and make a difference in the world, and, and, and by laborers. Jesus is not asking you to serve in, in professional ministry. Jesus is not asking you to, to, to go out and hand out tracts and, and, and have a blowhorn in your mouth screaming out to other people that if you don't repent, you're going straight to hell. Jesus is simply asking you to do, use your talents and your time to serve him in whatever capacity you can serve him. The, the woman in, in John chapter 4 was a laborer simply because she was willing to go out and tell her neighbors to come meet a man who told me everything about myself. And, and then she challenged them with this question. Could this be the Messiah? The demoniac in, in Mark chapter 5 was a laborer. He didn't go out preaching and teaching after being healed by Jesus, he simply, out of the joy that was erupting in his heart, could not help but go out and tell somebody what Jesus had done for him. Being a laborer simply means that you don't miss an opportunity to tell someone about Jesus because Jesus has been so good to you. Being a laborer simply means that you, whatever you have, your talents, your treasures, your time, you, you give over to Jesus 
and allow Jesus to use in whatever capacity he chooses so that Jesus can make a, a difference in the world. There is only one miracle story in the gospel apart from the resurrection that is told by all four gospel writers. Jesus is feeding of the 5,000 people. The 5,000 is simply the number of men. There may have been as many as 20,000 people that Jesus fed that day. And, and, and you know what made that, that miracle possible? John explains it to us. There, 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 there was a young man who had a, two pickled sardines and, and five loaves of bread. Not much, but he was willing to, to give it over to Jesus. And because he was willing to, to put it in Jesus' hands, Jesus transformed the little that he had and used it for the betterment of 20,000 people. Central, here's what it means to be a laborer, to put whatever you have in the hands of Jesus and let Jesus use it for the betterment of the world. In his job market assessment, Jesus explains to us there, there is a surplus of opportunities. There is a shortage of people who are willing to take advantage of those opportunities. But, but Jesus is not simply content to tell us the problem and do nothing about it. Jesus also states to us the solution. He says that the solution to the shortage of laborers is to ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. The solution that Jesus gives to the problem doesn't seem to meet the need. If, if you were running a business and you needed extra employees, how would you go about finding extra employees? You would put an ad in the paper. You would begin to recruit people, you would put out a help wanted sign, hoping that people would see the need and then respond. And, and oftentimes in churches, that's what we do. We, we try to recruit volunteers. We, we try to point out a need. We, we, we try to encourage people to come volunteer. But Jesus says that this is not the solution. The solution is to ask. The, the NIV softens a word that has a much stronger meaning. That, that word ask does not mean to simply ask. It, it, it means to entreat powerfully. A better translation of that word, some of your translations may have, beg or to pray. Jesus says the solution to a shortage of workers is not to recruit or exhort people to volunteer, but to pray to the Lord of the harvest. And, and here's why Jesus would say that. We pray, we beg, we, we ask God because God is sovereign over his harvest. He's sovereign over the process. He's sovereign over the people. He's sovereign over the provision. Jesus says that we should ask the Lord of the harvest, he, he's sovereign over the harvest, to send out workers into his harvest field. God is sovereign over the people who work in his harvest and where they work. When we apply for a job, we, we have our resume, we, we have a list of our qualifications, we, we, we tell our potential employer uh, about our work history because we know that our positions depends on our, our qualifications and experience. This, this may be true in a secular business, but this is not true of the economy of heaven. God is so sovereign over his harvest that he determines the people who work in his field and where they are working. It, it doesn't depend on your qualifications or lack thereof. It depends on the God who is sovereign over the people he sends. If that were not the case, then God certainly wouldn't hire the people he hired to work in his harvest field. Come here, Moses. Here's the position to lead a group of ornery, stubborn people out of Egypt into the promised land. Tell me your experience. Read to me your resume. Well, 
In my first executive position, I failed horribly, so much so that I was fired and had to run away. Now, I am a low-level manager working in my father-in-law's field. You know what, Moses? You're hired. <laughs> Come here, Gideon. Here's the position. I need a military strategist who can lead a group of 300 into war against a well-trained group of Philistines who outnumber you 10 to 1. Tell me about your experience, Gideon. Well, I I'm, a, I'm a farmer and a cowardly one at that, with no military experience whatsoever. You know what, Gideon? You're hired! <laughs> Position is, I need a missionary to the Gentiles to, to spread the word of God to people who don't know God. Paul, come here. Read to me your resume and your qualifications. Well, well listen. I persecute the church, and I don't want to spread the gospel. I want to kill Christians. You know what, Paul? You're hired for the job. God is sovereign over who he uses. God is sovereign over the people. And the only way you can explain how God chooses the people, who he chooses, is that God knows our qualifications even when we don't think we can do the job. And with God being sovereign over the, the people, here, here's what that means for us, Central. That means you and I don't have an excuse to say no to God when God asks us to do something. Whatever the task is, whatever your level of experience would whatever your level of qualifications, whatever you've done in the past, if, if God asks you to do something, <laughs> it's a reason he's asking you to do it. We, we pray so that God can fill positions because God is, over the, is sovereign over the people that he hires. He's sovereign over the people that he sends. But, but God also is sovereign over the provisions. In verse 3, Jesus gives us a, a job description. He says, go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Je Jesus tells us that for those of us who are hired to work into the mission of the gospel, and, and we are all hired to work in, in, for the kingdom, that we will encounter hostility and animosity along the way, and that's by design. The gospel is designed to be offensive. They're being persecuted all over the world, for sharing the gospel, and, and though we don't feel the extent of their persecution, our time is coming. Even in America, there is a growing hostility towards the message of the gospel. How else can you explain, if you put something on Twitter praising God, the response that you will get from the Twitter trolls? How, how else can you explain that you are becoming more uncomfortable sharing your faith? We are truly even in this country, like lamb among wolves. You, you would think, given the job description, that Jesus would offer potential workers an incredible benefits package. But instead, when Jesus explains the benefit package in verses 4 through verse 12, we get a sense that the benefits package of the gospel seems to be very little. Jesus tells them that, that do not take a purse or a bag or sandals. Wherever you can find a place to lay your head, lay your head there. Wherever you can eat, eat there. Jesus is saying for us to, to ignore some of our basic needs and just set out to work for the sake of the gospel. This doesn't sound like an incredible benefits package. Ignore our basic needs to set out for the work of the gospel. Do not take a purse with you. You don't need extra money. Do not take a bag with you. You don't need extra clothes. Do not take sandals with you. You don't need extra shoes. And without sandals, 
without clothes, without money, you are dependent on people. You will encounter some people who are hospitable. And if they are hospitable, wherever they tell you to sleep, sleep there. And whatever they give you to eat, eat that. That doesn't sound like a, a great benefits package. But, but behind this, there's a promise. Jesus is promising those who work for the sake of the gospel that God will take care of their needs. God will take care of their provisions. God will take care of their protection. Jesus is saying this, that, that if you make it your business to take care of God's business, God will make it his business to take care of your business. Let me say it again in case you missed it, that if you make it your business to take care of God's business, God will make it his business to take care of your business. Isn't that what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount when he tells people, do not worry about where you, your clothes or, 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 or what you'll eat or where you live. See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Let me finish. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagan run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well if you make it your business to take care of his business God will make it his business to take care of your business. David's testimony in Psalm 37 verse 25 is this, that I have been young and now I am old, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. God will make sure to take care of your business if you take care of his business. George Mueller is the patron saint for all missionaries who have to raise their own funds. Mueller is just this incredible, incredible man in the annals of church history. He, he was an evangelist in the, in the late part of the 19th century, but he is most known for opening an orphanage, the Ashley Down Orphanage, that at one time can house as many as 2,000 orphans. Mueller ran this orphanage for 20 years. And, 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 and listen to this central. In 20 years, he never solicited anyone for donations. Yet the orphanage always ran. The kids always had clothes. They always had food to eat. They always had their needs. And George Mueller not once asked anyone for a donation. There, there, there's a legendary story about George Mueller that, that a lot of people tell. It's of a time when 300 orphans woke up, got dressed for school, and went down for breakfast. As they were sitting at the tables for breakfast, uh, one of the orphan, orphanage directors came up to, to Mueller and said, we don't have bread or milk for the children. And, and Mueller's solution was instead of going out to solicit to ask, was, was simply to pray. They prayed for 30 minutes. And after 30 minutes of prayer, with the children growing increasingly hungry and needing to run off to school, he heard a, a knock on the door. It was of the town baker. And the town baker said he he, he couldn't sleep the night before that God laid in on his heart to, to, to give Mueller this. It was enough bread to feed the 300 children, but they were still in need of milk. 
after a few minutes, a, another knock on the door. It, it, it was the milkman. His carriage broke down a block away, and he could not continue with his milk delivery. He had one of two choices, either to allow the milk to sit in his carriage and spoil, or give the milk to Mueller and the orphans. And he asked Mueller, do you need milk today? So simply through prayer, Mueller found the resources, the provisions that he needed to feed 300 orphans to give them bread and milk. And given that story, what, what's there to stop us from going out and doing what God asked us to do, knowing that we serve a God who is sovereign over our provisions, that if we make it our business to take care of his business, God will make it his business to always take care of our business. The harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. But Central, you and I have no excuse not to be laborers. Will you pray with me? Lord, we pray that you would use us Use us in whatever capacity you choose, Lord God. Use us however you choose, Lord God. Our, our lives are now available to you. And thank you we have the assurance that you will take care of all of our needs. You will provide all the resources that we need along the way. Father, thank you that you are a God who's faithful. And we pray that you would send laborers out into your harvest field. Now we pray, Father God, that as your spirit works someone would respond to the call either of salvation or to labor in your harvest field. Working and through uh, the message, working and through your spirit. Do what you'd like during this time of dedication, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.